Samuel Zamuri, better known as Sam the Banana Man, was born to a Jewish family in Kishinev in present-day Moldova in 1877. He grew up on a wheat farm, his father dying young, leaving the family in poverty. Sam moved to America with his aunt when he was 12. By the time he was 15, he was as hardened as any of the men pictured in black and white photos of American immigrants from the turn of the century. After saving his pennies as a manual laborer in Mobile, Alabama, Sam moved on to New Orleans, watching the West Indian dock workers unload bananas from South America. The ripes, bananas that had ripened and spotted during their transport on the boats, were discarded, as they'd never make it to market before they spoiled. Where others saw only garbage, Zamuri saw an opportunity. He purchased the ripes for next to nothing and sold them locally. Woody advertising focusing on the taste and nutritious value of bananas, a food few immigrants had ever seen, made his first business venture a success. From these humble beginnings, Zamuri would make his fortune in the banana trade, eventually becoming the head of the United Fruit Company, the industry leader for most of the 20th century. No one knows for sure, but it's alleged that he hired the CIA and American gangsters to overthrow South American governments that wanted to levy heavy taxes or nationalize his plantations. For better or worse, Sam made bananas a staple of the American diet. Never a man with a strong sense of Jewish identity, so Murray was surprised to be contacted by Chaim Weitzman in 1922. The two men kept in touch and Zamuri became a quiet sponsor of Weitzman's Zionist activities. Their conversations lasted for hours, transitioning from English when talking about money, Russian for struggles, and Yiddish for the heartaches faced by the Jews. Like other men of his generation, Zamuri, neither religious or involved in the Jewish community, was inspired by Zionism. Other than dominating the banana trade, it became the driving force of his life. The horrors of the Holocaust solidified his passion. Soon after VJ Day, Zamuri received a call from Zev Shin, a member of the Mossad who was in need of money, ships, documents, and expertise from Zamuri in the face of the British white paper that banned immigration to Palestine. Zamuri agreed, but on the condition that this help would be in secret, as the United Fruit Company was partially under British control. Zamuri donated money for ships to carry emigrants to Israel. As November 29, 1947 approached, Zamuri was enlisted to strong arm his contacts in Latin American governments to vote for the United Nations Resolution 181, the plan for the partition of Palestine. From his home office in his New Orleans mansion, Zamuri made the calls. No votes became abstentions, abstentions became yes. Zamuri is still uncredited as the man who secured the votes needed for the partition of Palestine to pass. Despite voting for partition and recognizing Israel's independence, President Truman enforced an embargo on shipping weapons to the Middle East during Israel's War of Independence. Israel was desperate for arms. You name it, they did not have enough. Bullets, rifles, pistols, grenades, trucks, tanks. When the IDF was created, the Air Force consi consisted of a single plane. As the Arab countries were already well armed, the Jordanian army was commanded by British officers. The embargo fell disproportionately on Israel. An underground network of American Jews sent all the weapons they could get their hands on to New Orleans, where they were packaged in Sam's basement into boxes marked food or supplies and sent to Israel. So Murray died in 1961 in New Orleans, but his impact on the state of Israel is far greater than his notoriety as a business leader. The Jewish state might not exist if not for Sam the Banana Man, secret hero of the state of Israel. Sam's mansion is the place where he met with Weitzman, wrote the checks that funded illegal immigration, called the Latin American leaders to secure their votes, and packaged weapons to break through the American embargo. It is now the home of the president of Tulane University. If you find yourself in uptown New Orleans, make sure to ask for a tour. Created using Powtoon.